What we're going to talk about this morning is uh, bladder cancer, um, another area I think that's of considerable interest and particularly because um, it's an area where as much as anything we do, the morphology and looking at glass slides has an enormous impact on patient management. And you, by the color of my hair, you know that I still like glass slides and H&Es and, and uh, still sort of a real glass pusher. So bladder cancer is uh, relatively common, particularly in men. It's the fourth most common cancer in men and the seventh most common cause of cancer deaths, much less uh, um, important in terms of a cancer uh, in females. But, can't, but bladder cancer is sort of contributes uh, disproportionately because of the nature of the disease. So as you know, the majority of bladder cancer patients present with non-invasive papillary tumors, and they have a very prolonged clinical history that includes multiple uh, cystoscopies, multiple biopsies, and probably transurethral resections, as well as uh, urine cytology. So any given bladder cancer patient, many of them are really kind of a big time contributor uh, to pathology uh, labs into the material that we see. The uh, World Health Organization Blue Book was released in 2016, as you know, so there have been um, some changes in, in bladder, um, not a huge amount, and, and they're more around the edges, I think, than in the major uh, topics. In 2004, uh, the WHO, sort of the process, was really a bit of a battle because it was still the argument about the, the grading system and old 1973 WHO. Uh, this is the group that, that met in Zurich that developed the, uh, the new Blue Book um, that you uh, are aware of, and this is the actual bladder cancer. The, the, the team is divided into sort of subgroups, and this is the bladder cancer writing group, and Dr. Victor Reuter from Memorial chaired the bladder cancer um, writing group. Now, when we talk, again, when we talk about bladder cancer, the majority of patients, about 80% of patients, when they first walk in the door with symptoms, are going to be presenting with non-muscle invasive disease, and the majority of them will be non-invasive papillary tumors. And we know that what happens to these patients over time is two things. One, they frequently will get additional tumors in the future, so they need to be followed for, re not really recurrences in the sense that it's the same tumor coming back, but the development of new tumors. And if you look at the predictors for the development of new tumors, so which patients are most likely to get another tumor sometime in the future, uh, this is a point system from the EORTC risk tables, and you can see the number of tumors, whether they've already had a recurrence once, uh, and the tumor size are the three most important predictors of patients who are likely to come back with another tumor in the future. On the other hand, if we want to predict which of those patients are going to progress to muscle invasive, life-threatening bladder cancer, then the most important parameters are, is there associated carcinoma in situ? Is there... Um, is it a high-grade tumor? And in a sense, is it a T1 tumor uh, in this group? So non-muscle invasive tumors. And then the others are also important. But So you can see there's kind of a flip of what is important and what isn't. Now, the 2016 classification is exactly the same. There is nothing changed in 2016 from 2004, which is good because that's really the biggest part of it. As I said at the meeting in, in Zurich, we spent most of our time discussing variants. We spent a lot of time discussing um, sort of T1 disease and a variety of other things, but this has sort of off the table uh, at that meeting because uh, we were just going to continue on with what we'd already done. Now, as you know, urothelium is a multi-layered uh, epithelium. It's a specialized type epithelium. Uh, it has a basal layer, then the, the majority of the cells are those sort of elongated, uh, somewhat, um, uh, not really columnar cells, but elongated cells with the elongated nuclei, and then the surface umbrella cell layer. Um, the umbrella cell layer may react quite nicely with cytokeratin-20, but often when you do a cytokeratin-20, you only see scattered umbrella cells that stain. The urothelium, of course, can have a lot of reactive atypias, and we see this uh, a lot in the context of patients with uh, chronic inflammatory processes, uh, chronic cystitis, particularly in females, and we see a lot of biopsies with reactive atypias. Pro most problematic for us, of course, is that a lot of the reactive atypias that we see are in the setting of patients with known bladder tumors, and the reactive atypia may be related to a therapy that they're getting, for example, BCG. So patients with high-grade non-invasive papillaries or CIS or T1 tumors that are receiving BCG are going to have follow-up biopsies, and of course, they've got an inflamed bladder because that's what BCG does. 
When we see reactive atypias in the urothelium, generally speaking, uh, they, they may be a thickened epithelium. So when you see a thickened epithelium uh, in the bladder, it's usually reactive. Carcinoma in situ is, is not very common for CIS to be thick. Generally, CIS is a thin lesion. However, reactive atypias can also be quite thin, as in this example, particularly if it's sort of a regenerative epithelium at the site of a previous transurethral resection. In reactive atypias, the nuclei tend to round up, so you often get rounder nuclei as opposed to the elongated nuclei of normal urothelium. You can see quite prominent nucleoli in, this in these cells, but what you don't see is very much enlargement of the nuclei. So if you look at the nuclei in here and you compare them with, say, an endothelial cell nucleus there, you can see there's not much difference in size from an endothelial cell nucleus. They can be sort of two, maybe even pushing three times larger, but they're really in that kind of a range. I think nuclear size is a very helpful feature uh, when you're thinking about a reactive process versus carcinoma in situ.